Folks, I need you to take an incredibly good look at this map right here. I need you to examine the Russia that has been stable and that has grown to an unbelievable degree with now 131 million people within it. I want you to take a look at Europe that looks very calm, but of course has a lot of irredentism, where the Italians want to take their territory from Austria, where Germany wants to take Alsace-Lorraine while France wants to settle a debt with Britain, and of course, I mean, just in general, everybody sing uh, simply absolutely detests the British altogether. This is a very interesting map with a China that fairly soon, I think, will actually implode with an Africa that is also currently a powder keg that hopefully we will set on fire today because, well, I have some ambitions down there. This is the very last video where we are going to be playing Brazil here on the channel in Victoria 3 until we, you know, play it again in a different campaign. You see, if you followed this channel, then you will know what I'm doing here. But if you haven't followed this channel, then let me explain. I don't do playthroughs where I conquer everything, where we'll have a world conquest. No, quite the opposite. I do playthroughs where we form a society that is different from the last one, that had its own up and downs, that had to fight with its internal and its external enemies, and in the end emerges, you know, beautiful or not so beautiful. We had a couple of uh, devastatingly terrible playthroughs, for example in Italy, where we became a genuine menace. But here in Brazil, honestly, we had a pretty good reign. Pedro II and of course his daughter Isabel both were unbelievably competent, leaving behind now a country that is so modern, I mean, I can't really overstate it. Proportional taxation, commercialized agriculture, census suffrage and even cultural exclusion. Although, I do want to add that our queen actually endorses multiculturalism. Sorry, our empress. So, as you can see, we have achieved so much, and there's still more that I want to do in this particular video. I want to go ahead and hopefully completely take down the locations right here, mostly the Cape Colony and then everything here in West South Africa. All that stuff should belong to the Brazilian Empire so that we, directly on the same latitude, have something beautiful. And that is, of course, our empire, from sea to sea, from coast to coast and from ocean to ocean. So today I just want to finish our transformation on a domestic level and then hopefully whenever the European powder keg explodes, if indeed it does, challenge Britain for territory that we think should be ours. Because well, it was debated to fall into our hands when we split from Portugal all the way back in 1821. I do also want to say um, that we have built effectively an export economy. I absolutely love this. This was not always viable and this wouldn't have been viable without the latest hotfix. But take a look at that. Yep. We are the dominating force when it comes to rubber. Of course, the British have a lot going on there as well, but I mean, my god, this is all in the center of our empire. The Amazon has been tamed. Ah, it's beautiful to see, and quite frankly, it's even more beautiful to see that we are literally financing all of this. Or rather, no, 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 they are financing us by buying it so that they can build cars, so that they can, for example, build uh, planes, telephones, and so on. We are giving this stuff to all of these people, and it makes me so happy. Because in any previous version, A, these people wouldn't even have built telephones, but, and I think this is much more important, well, what we are looking at is effectively a proper export economy. Take a look at this right here. If we sort this by sell orders, you can see that we don't really produce all that much. And quite frankly, I have to say as well, even this right here, we aren't producing this. There, there are 2,500 units of grain coming in from other markets. I guess what I'm saying is we have a strong, a powerful economy and yet, it is literally all built on one resource. Again, if you don't want to go full autarky, you can now do that and it makes me so unbelievably happy because it is just satisfying to see us rise up through the ranks with literally just rubber. All right, but listen, enough fawning about that. Let's take a look at our domestic politics. Um, we currently, if I'm not mistaken, have an election running. There it is, that is indeed true. And it is an astonishing victory by the Liberal Party. I don't know where they came from. I don't know how they did this. I think it's primarily because we really upped our literacy here. But man, the trade unions and the intelligentsia are indeed nailing it. And that, of course, just confirms the cause of our beloved queen. So with that in mind, I think I would like to maybe go further on census suffrage, although I mean, a lot of people don't like this. People really want to move to technocracy, but I don't think the Empress is, uh, you know, in on that stuff. I think I would much rather, <laughs> I would much rather do something good for the children. Let's take a look at that. I'm not going to initiate multiculturalism. It's basically the issue of Pedro II and slavery. Uh, she wants this, but it goes too far for her country. It wouldn't be wise to, you know, instigate anything in that direction. 
I think I'm just gonna say, why don't we pass compulsory primary school? Let's make sure that this is the most learned nation on earth. All right, and that is the domestic stuff. Uh, externally speaking, I'm gonna be honest with you. I have ambitions here. I want this entire chunk, and it shouldn't be too difficult because Tswana here already has a claim of ours, which means nobody else can settle it. And this right here, if I'm not mistaken, there you go, has a claim of the Brazilian South African, uh, you know, colonial nation of ours, which is really, really good news. Because what we're now going to do is, we're going to settle this, they're going to settle this, and then we have this middle piece for us, and then we just need to transfer the Cape Colony and claim this area here in a war. Easier said than done, but yeah. As you can see, we are also currently defeating communist South Africa. These people down here really just, they, they can't take a hint. I'm going to put them down every time this happens. Um... Let's speed it up. And you know what I was actually thinking about? Uh, I was looking at a standard of living and I was thinking, man, this isn't that great. This isn't amazing at all. When we, for example, look at Germany, you can see middling 15.0. But then I noticed it's actually really down to whatever's going on in our colonies. Look at this. We're at 14, 15.6 uh, here even. We're at 14 in the major provinces, 14.8 right there. If we get rid of this territory right here, if we give it to a colonial nation, for example, I think we are probably already sitting at 15 in incorporated territory. Well, as you can see, we are pretty wealthy. I think the large, uh, you know, majority of this basically comes from the fact that we have cars and telephones in our market, which is good for communication and so on and so forth. But more importantly, proportional taxation. It's easy. Instead of taxing just the person because they exist, we tax income, we tax consumption, and we tax, most importantly, dividends. So ultimately, hey, uh, we already are incredibly, incredibly wealthy. People are still mad, but don't worry about it, okay? We got a good police. I would also, by the way, really like it if we could utilize the United States of America when it comes to, you know, settling our grievances with the British, but... Uh, I'm not too sure. The defensive pact was ended not too long ago. It makes a lot of sense. We uh, tend to have a lot of infamy. Not right now, but in the last couple of, uh, you know, <laughs> years here. So I understand it, but obviously they still like us. We're still allies. We're still partners, I should say. Maybe we can call them in, but I wouldn't bet on it primarily because, well, they really are incredibly America-centric. If we declare a war down here, they wouldn't even see it. Hey, but speak of the devil, a devil, maybe we don't even need them. If you take a look at our queue here, you can see that we have a lot in terms of barracks queued because I need to bring the army really up there. But on top of that, we also actually need to go on and make sure that we have the most modern army possible. We need trench infantry. Only trench infantry can really aid us here, because right here in Guyana, we will have to defend against the British, and then of course we will have to win in the colonies. We got trench infantry now, and we are going for telephone and then radio. I'm not doing this because I want people to, hey, wow, well, what a nice consumer good. No, 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 I'm going to import that stuff. I'm not even going to build these factories. I don't care. We, we don't need to do this. We have money coming from rubber as it is. Instead, um, we're going to go look at that. Yeah, we need the radio so that I can actually get siege artillery. These two are tightly, tightly connected. And then once we have that, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we can crush the British. At least I would hope so. See, if you take a look at our actual laws here, you will see colonial exploitation comes with a lot, yeah. Subsistence output goes down, tension decay, starting wages, all of them are negatively affected. Because that is what colonialism is. It's not good for the people that you take over. Oh ha, and would you look at that. Our industrialists are building the very first power plants of the country. This one is going to be in Goyas, which is a novel decision. I guess it is meant to, you know, sort of maybe introduce electric rail, that sort of stuff. And this is a very important location. Realistically speaking, we are currently, I would guess, bringing all of the rubber that we're getting in these areas through the Amazon, of course, to the coast and then to the markets where they need to be. If we build a proper rail network that goes all the way inland, we could sell the rubber right here. We could sell it right over there instead of being limited here in Para. Interesting stuff. With these power plants, we are also looking at... Uh, some prettier colors. I already said that I really, really enjoy the way this looks here in the night, but check out Europe right here. Isn't this beautiful? When we take a look at the cities of Europe, we can see the cities that have proper electric streetlights. We can see the cities that have no streetlights, and we can of course see the cities also that have proper coal-fired lights right there. Look at that. It's so gorgeous. I love it. Uh, and now, of course, we actually should go on and build these power plants right here so that we can upgrade our lights in Brazil proper. 
So take a look at this right here. We have uh, our leader, our current Prime Minister, Rui Barbosa, and he was incredibly important, historically speaking, as well, because he was there as a finance minister when Enciliamento happened, which is essentially a debt crisis, where Brazil just had a lot of credit to give for industrialization of the country, and, well, that didn't pan out so well. He got ousted, and then instead... Take a look at this guy. This guy took over, General Floriano Peugeotto. Now, of course, he's not going to do this in this playthrough because we're doing fine. We are growing. We have a great export economy. And as long as those markets don't collapse, which surely they won't, we will also be doing fine. Then right here, we have Julio de, uh, Julio de Castillos. We already talked about this guy. And then over there, we have Rodriguez Alves. Also mentioned him already. All of these people are present. They have their own history. And I'm going to be honest with you, just looking at this, I think currently is the calmest period ever in Brazilian political history. Because sure, there's a free trade party. There's an opposition uh, led by the conservative party. And then, of course, in government is the liberal party. But I mean, check this out. The Free Trade Party? Positivists. The Petite Bourgeoisie right here, the strongest faction of the Conservative Party? Positivists. This guy's a reformer. This is a moderate. And then right here we have just the leadership that is inclusive of the laborers. I think everybody just says, hey, the status quo is pretty good. Let's keep it going. We also passed compulsory primary school, which is just amazing. Let's up this one uh, more level. And then after that, I'm, I mean, hmm. What is popular? What is going on in the government? What exactly do they want? Mass conscription is kind of promising, kind of interesting. Obviously, we can't actually do cooperative ownership. I'm not going to really go too far with healthcare. I think we're doing okay when it comes to that. Ah, you know what I would like to see? Women's suffrage. Yeah, I'm going to be honest with you. Um... This is not the historical Isabel. There's a completely different ideology behind that. This is basically the Isabel if she had grown up in a realm where it was completely permissible and understandable for a woman to rule if Pedro II and the Brazilian society had seen it that way. This is essentially a reimagined Isabel. And in her mind, I think, yeah, there's nothing wrong with the idea of saying women should also have a say in society. In this case, women's suffrage. Absolutely. I do wonder for how much longer Isabel is gonna live. She has expensive tastes and, of course, she has syphilis as well. And syphilis actually lowers her life expectancy. Now, the man that comes after her is Carlos, and he's charismatic and erudite. I think he has nothing when it comes to too controversial an opinion. In fact, he is more moderate than his mother. I think we are really stable, although his face speaks volumes. And there it is, women's suffrage. If that isn't beautiful, then I don't know what is. Uh, and with that, I mean, <laughs> we're pretty close to the end of everything that we wanted to do here in terms of the reform programs of, you know, Isabel herself. We might want to look into workers' protections. It will make the industrialists angry, but... Ah, the trade unions have helped us so much here in government. In fact, they have passed women's suffrage. And they're not communist. You know what? I'll do them a favor. Sure, I shall do them a favor. I also can't help but notice that there is a communist revolution here in Ecuador. Um, we can't have that. They're being bankrolled by the US. We really can't have that. I think if they win here, yep, there it goes. We will have an immediate response for them. I, I think I'm just going to make them into protectorate. I've used I've been using this very sparingly, and again, we end up with this really cool Chilean Argentinian union that is now gone. They used to be in one market, but that stuff is really awesome because hey, they blossom without me doing anything. But Ecuador, directly in our neighborhood, I don't think we can have that. And on top of that, they also do have uh, additional rubber right here. I think I'm going to turn them into a protectorate sta uh, straight up. Unless no, we currently have zero infamy. I think it's time. Uh, you shall fall. And you know what? I really like the idea of turning that into a coalition effort. I'm going to go ahead and say maybe a League of Nations exists, maybe something like that is actually flourishing, and I will give myself, together with Peru, a mandate to take care of Ecuador here. We can't have this destabilization of the Pacific trade. You can actually see right here the Americans also built the canal, so yeah, we need some clarity right here in this particular position. And I'm gonna say, Peru, yep, you can have indeed a regime change right here, which will make Ecuador my puppet, or rather my protectorate, and give them a non-communist government, so everybody wins.
You know, I knew that it was going to be a great decision to have kept Brazilian Pastaza. This really was an addition to my collection. It's a bit sad to see Venezuela leave us. I think they just owed something to the Germans. Ooh, interesting. Wow, they really are now asserting their hegemony, huh? And I'm not going to go against that, I think. I, I'm just going to... We're just going to take a look at that and say, hey, keep it up. You take the north, I take the south, okay? Anyway, Venezuela was uh, pulled from our market by the Germans... I'm kind of okay with that because we have very stable sulfur gaining trade relationships but yeah we did some investments in Venezuela and it didn't pay off in the end. With Ecuador I think it will because they will just join our backyard. Just take this in. They had 12 battalions and they have 500 men left. We really have come a long, long way since the days of our very first excursions here against Venezuela, against Ecuador, actually initially against New Granada and so on. We have become a proper nation with a proper army. Now, this is weird. Uh, <laughs> Julio de Castillos has challenged Carlos de Braganza to a duel to the death. I'm sorry, this is the last episode, you know I have to do it. You know I have to press this button. If he dies, he dies. Our heir killed Julio de Castillos. Bye-bye, uh, buddy. Alright, and there you go, we have restored now a much, much better Ecuador, although still apparently uh, led by a communist? Well, let's hope that that changes in due time. It doesn't really matter because they are now our protectorate. They are safe from communism, much like the good old Boers are. Now anyway, um, what I would like to do is actually do you a favor. As soon as we have good relationships, I'm gonna give them the rest of Pastaza. I think now that they are in our sphere, we can do that. I, quite frankly, never even incorporated this because, yeah, doesn't really belong to me. It's fine. We just managed it. And folks, Please behold, this is a gorgeous coastline. You can see just how much more settled it is now. But with one click, I will make it even more beautiful. Boom. Look at that. All of a sudden, we have the clean electric streetlight that will, from now until eternity, enlighten the beautiful empire of Brazil. All right, and now it is time to even up our minimum wage because, hey, there's one thing that is true and that is that this Brazil is carried by every single inhabitant. I am so happy. Just for the record, uh, we had a really, really reactionary dominated empire for so damn long. Pedro II had to struggle because if we ever pushed it too far, we would have lost Pedro points via the revolution. If you take a look at this, you will see that we have 12 million Afro-Brazilians, 11 million Brazilians, and then so many other people and all of them it has to be said are integrating take a look at that they're all assimilating now the important part here is that we have a uh, far beyond any measure when it comes to population density here that is because obviously i played better than the historical brazil don't tell the brazilians if you're brazilian please do not listen but most importantly take a look at the oh god uh let's just say the united states of america aren't getting any migrants anytime soon okay <laughs> God damn! <laughs> huh. Whew. Oh, and speak of the devil, I was just upgrading our ironclads to dreadnoughts and then it appears Emperor Carlos de Braganza, a man that killed another man, has now inherited the empire from his mother Isabella. He's only 20 or uh, 21 years of age and I guess we only have one option. We're going to be marrying him into the Van Oranje Nassau House of Luxembourg. That is very, very interesting. He now rules as, I think, a pretty legit... He doesn't really have a big agenda. He's the first of his kind when it comes to that. Uh, he's just going to rule as a widely accepted emperor. Maybe as somebody that is going to change the government, all things considered, because he is, of course, a member of the petite bourgeoisie. I would really like it if you instead joined not the conservatives, though. Uh, yeah, we'll see about this, okay? One way or another, we're looking at a situation where, indeed, we have a new emperor and he looks at a stable, non-ambitious reign, which is a complete novelty. Uh, what's happening here? Socialist internationalism. The National Liberation Alliance is receiving election campaign support from the communist armed forces in Italy. You are communist? Oh my god, you are communist. Giuseppe del Re. Wait a minute. They're not communists per se, okay, so the Italians are intervening and it doesn't surprise me I should say as well because we have plenty of South and North Italians living here in Brazil. They're not welcome here 
Um, oh my god, I see what happened. Did you found your own party? They founded their own jingoist party? <laughs> I will limit foreign influence here for sure. I will not let communism happen more often in our country. At least I will play this in a way where I will try to oppose it. Fabio Labatou. Ah, named after the monster. I see how it is. How are these elections going? A lot of conservatism. Okay, that's good. Liberals doing well. National Liberation Alliance at 17%. That is worrying. That is very, very worrying indeed. Don't betray the system, okay, pal? And you know what? I wasn't going to do this as long as Isabel was in charge because her personal ideology was very much in favor of democracy. But now we have Carlos right here and he has a conservative, positivist-led government. And I think there's really only one thing that I want to do here. I think we're going to be moving towards technocracy. It's going to make the old alliance, the intelligentsia and the trade unions, very, very unhappy. But I don't think it matters. Because we must be ruled by experts if we want this system to persist. There's one lesson to take away here. And that is that you cannot trust the trade unions. They immediately turned around and took support from communists in Italy. Absolutely not. I'm going to go with technocracy in the hope that this indeed is the last step that is needed to cement the empire forever. And there we have it. Technocracy. Now, I'm not sure what this is going to mean because they will have to recalculate, of course, the political strength, the alignment and so on. Technically, we could be running a command economy right now. And I will admit that the emperor, if he has any agenda, most certainly doesn't really love commercialized agriculture. He much prefers homesteading or collectivized agriculture. But as it stands, I... Oh, wow. This may just be the very first really good government under Carlos. Ooh. And the petite bourgeoisie has flipped to, well, maybe emulate what the Americans are doing. Oh boy. Uh, <laughs> people here are real sickos, you know? Real, genuine sickos. I mean, my god. <laughs> oh no. Um, the British flu. A massive outbreak of an especially deadly strain of flu has broken out in Highlands. It threatens to spread rapidly, potentially escalating into a global pandemic. The epidemic of influenza, like a specter of death, was upon us almost overnight. And three days after the disease was made reportable by the Board of Health, our hospital was full to overflowing with victims of the pestilence. I hope it does not reach Brazil. By neighboring states are common markets. Um, well, we don't share a market with the British. <laughs> That sucks, but we border them. <laughs> we border them quite aggressively. Right. Uh, damn. And now we are being tested. We are being tested because we have established a technocracy. In fact, we have become an enlightened despotate. This is a government type ruled by the philosopher king or philosopher queen, the most powerful figure amongst the class of enlightened scholar aristocracy. That is exactly what is happening here. But we also have a strike going on. Workers in the shipyards have had enough of their poor conditions. Working with the trade unions, they have initiated an industry-wide strike in Sao Paulo. We have created this situation. We have a global pandemic coming our way. And we have the strike now going on. We are in a really well-positioned, you know, position. But at the same time, I'm not sure whether we will give in to the workers here or whether we should simply strike them down. To rescue the toiler from the grasp of the selfish is a work worthy of the noblest and best of our race. Are you willing to accept the responsibility and, trusting in the support of pledged true knights, labor with what ability you possess for the triumph of these principles among men? Is this like the pledge of the American Knights of Labor, whatever it's called? Anyway, open negotiations with the strikers. We have to pass a law or expand an institution favorable to the trade unions. Or the strikes must be suppressed. Um... I think we have worked with them so far. Let me just see your ideology. They're jingoist. They're not socialist. They just want, you know, better treatment. Okay. I will open negotiations. Uh, what do you need from me, pal? Oh, okay, sorry. Here we are. Strike. Labor negotiations. After a thorough discussion with union leaders, they have agreed to suspend the strike if any of their major demands are met. The industrialists that rob us on a large scale also have the power to control the government and legalize their robbery. We, who work hardest and produce the most, have the least. We can run the mills without them, but they cannot run them without us. I could promise to expand social security and we must expand this institution. Or I could say wage subsidies. 
Oh, that sucks. Okay, so I'm gonna do polos, which is basically, we're doing a, a, you know, we're cracking the whip while at the same time also giving them some carrot. What I mean here is, we are going to indeed expand the workplace safety office institution, which in this case, of course, is a high minimum wage and so on. That's completely fine. But I will also be passing poor laws, because poor laws makes it so that the poor have less power. And I mean, that is exactly how it ought to be, right? So we're going to go ahead and indeed promise this because, oh, we got destroyers. Now we're talking. Uh, we can easily expand this. Shouldn't really be any issue whatsoever. And then afterwards, once this crisis is over, they will have less power than before. And that's the dream. And oh man, I gotta be completely honest with you here. I didn't think it would happen right now. It's 1915 and it appears that there will be a major, major war here between France, Britain, the Netherlands and Spain. All of these factions are getting involved here over, you know, what is essentially col a colonial dispute. But this should keep the British incredibly busy. And I gotta tell you, I think I can be confident when it comes to our ability, Brazil's ability here to fight the British on land, uh, on the ocean, not so much. I will also say the Americans just took on my loans. Bless ya. I love ya. I am currently on a bit of an adventure here. Didn't even mention it because we're basically just freeing, you know, Anhui up here from the Heavenly Kingdom. We're helping the U.S. uprising. I'm just meddling in China, if you will. But honestly, we might just go in against the British right about now when we finish this or maybe even before we finish it, quite frankly. I gotta tell you, just look at these numbers. This is disgusting. <laughs> We're losing basically nothing, whereas they are losing everything. In total, I have lost 3,600 men in attrition and 300 in battle because that is how little the Heavenly Kingdom's troops are doing against us here. Ooh, I am ready to jump in against the British, I think. Bro, these numbers are actually disgusting. Look at this. Look at these numbers. I guess that's what happens when you come with siege artillery and trench infantry and they come with nothing. Oh, and wait a minute. My war goal is gone. My my war goal is actually gone. Um, I... Hmm, that sucks. I think I'm gonna take this state and then I'm just gonna peace out. Yep, as you can see, I have... <laughs> Demolish them is a very fair term. Uh, I'm gonna peace out here. I'm good. I don't get anything out of this. I hope the Yue can do it on their own, but even if they can't, we have helped them enough. What matters now is that we actually jump straight on this. Look at that. The British are being torn apart. In the colonies, it's not looking good. And I think that is my time. My time to shine. Um, I would like to transfer subject. If we get the Cape Colony, I can immediately jump in and just hand that over to Brazilian South Africa. On top of that, we definitely need the British Herrera land, and then we will need these two. This and this. And I think that's everything I will take in this. Well, honestly, I would even be fine with just exchanging these two, you know, against all of this, but be that as it may, it's time to challenge the British. Let's do this. All right, but let's do some planning here. We need some type of defensive force right here. You can see they're coming here and we can't keep them from coming. They just have a huge navy. Now, the upside is that they are busy with their navy against the French and the French have a pretty sizable one. The Americans also have a sizable one. And if we call them in all in all, the British are very unlikely to be able to nuke me. Uh, they could do that if we were just 1v1. But you can see here, we planned this. Our navy isn't big enough to actually oppose them. Although, honestly, we got dreadnoughts. We're not doing too poorly. Let me take a look at theirs here. They got torpedo boats, monitors, ironclads. They're doing fine, but not as well as we are doing. Right, so what we're going to do is, um, I'm going to go ahead, command all of you to just entirely defend nothing else. Um, and then I'm going to mobilize you and send you to this front line. It's fine if you take some attrition. Don't worry about it. You, in the meantime, are going to go down there and fight the uh, uh, South Africans. And then you are going to go to the front right here. And I think that is what we're going to do. If they position troops here, which is unlikely, we should see how we can do that or what we do about that. But yeah. Oh, wait a minute. The Portuguese are not in this war. Because they're just a protectorate. Oh, I should have declared against them first. You know what? Honestly, it doesn't really matter. As long as we secure South Africa, that is a really good start. Now, obviously, as I said, I will be calling in the Americans. And, ooh, what is this? You want to liberate Bolivia? Wait a minute. Bolivia is probably just in the market, aren't they? It's a protectorate? Oh, my God. Um, I agree. Bolivia needs to be free. This is the Monroe Doctrine. This is the Pedro Doctrine. Get them out of here. Now, honestly, I don't know about this, but this is, I feel, for all the marbles. I'm gonna go ahead and say transfer Portugal to me. 
I want my mother nation back. That is all I can say there, I think. I am so close to the 100 infamy. So close. But we're not quite getting there. All right, folks, let's take a quick look around. They did not have the manpower to defend the Cape Colony. Equally, we are advancing right here and we are marching straight towards the French soldiers that are also victorious. The colonies of Great Britain are virtually abandoned because they are fighting, look at that, with 200 divisions right here in Spain itself. Um, we are in a position where we are also, yep, we are losing some stuff. The raiding isn't yet taking over, but it is getting there. At the same time, again, this is a very, very easy front. We are succeeding here. We're going to get Herrero land as well. Uh, we are also actually winning right here in Guyana. I didn't claim that, but yeah, I love to see that because I wasn't certain whether we could pull that off. What kind of troop did they bring, by the way? Oh my god, they got squad infantry. Um, and yet... They are being defeated, okay. So our siege artillery is definitely doing the work there. And then at the same time, the Americans are alone marching into Santa Cruz. I absolutely adore it. Now, the big issue here will be, first of all, take a look at what they're demanding. It's a lot. But the big issue will be that we need to get not just Herrera land and Bolivia, which is easy. We also need to get Portugal. <sighs> I am currently building more troops. You can see right here we're building a huge naval base boost here. This is in Sao Paulo alone. And I'm actually going to go ahead and straight up knock this decree down there. I need more ships so that we can hopefully invade in Portugal. I think it's doable. I, I'm not sure whether we can invade the, uh, the British Isles because normally it will take some time. They will move a fleet there and I mean you're seeing the fleet. They will demolish us. I am hopeful that maybe we can do Portugal. Let's see what we can do here. I'm going to speed build up a navy, that's for sure. For decades now, we have tried to get our motherland, the old motherland anyway, back from those that occupy it. The British have taken over and the British have absolutely, to no avail, insistent on owning it. But now, the British fleets are preoccupied. The entire world is at war with Britain. And quite frankly, everybody hates them as well. They're losing the war against the Netherlands and France, and they are losing the war against America and us. We're winning right here in the colonies. We're winning in Bolivia. We have won in Guyana. And now is the time to invade Portugal. And let me just say, this will be a disaster. We will let people never forget 1916. While we were fighting with a strike, and while we were fighting indeed with the, well, you guessed it, uh, English flu, we're now, well, technically the Scottish flu, I guess, the British flu. We are looking at a situation where we are annihilating the fleet that they have mustered. <laughs> Their fleet is everywhere but where it needs to be because so much is happening on the globe against them. It's really interesting to think about as well, of course, in World War I, it was very clear who the enemy would be to the British. They said, we just need to lock this down. Strategically speaking, that is all we need to do when you have to fight a global enemy made up of multiple countries. Where do you put your fleet? They made the wrong decision because, my god, I have prepared the ultimate force to take over. Machine gunners, flamethrowers, first aid of course, then we got all these supplements and indeed also luxurious supplies. The time for our invasion comes right now. And here we are. The invasion has begun. General Urbano Labatu, what a name right here, a staunch royalist is leading the assault against General Ernesto da Silva Pereira. It is over. Portugal will return to our crown. It will be unified with Carlos as the head and the United Kingdom will rise once more. We at this point can no longer be stopped. Look at this. We're advancing, we're succeeding, we're burning them alive. I mean, just look at this. They certainly weren't prepared for this. And after that, there's nothing stopping us from capitulating the British. As I said, this war is over. The only thing, truth be told, that we can call this is complete annihilation of our enemies. And again, to be fair, I need to stress, we couldn't have done it without the French. If they hadn't pushed this harshly, this aggressively into Britain, if the Americans hadn't stood by our side, we most certainly couldn't have made this happen because our fleet is nowhere near what it needs to, you know, to actually be to challenge the British. But with united force against isolated Brits, we take whatever we want. And a big part of that, hello dear clowns, is of course Lisbon. We must take the entirety of Portugal if we want to call ourselves the true de Braganza dynasty. Oh my god, it's done. It's actually done. If they didn't have to spread their forces as thinly as they did, it would have never happened. But this is effectively a world war against British hegemony. 
it's over for them. And so, in 1917, the war ends. And we emerge victoriously. Take a good look at that. First of all, Bolivia is free. The British no longer can control them. At the same time, we took Herrera land and we also, of course, took Portugal. Now, they're not too happy about this, but don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. It's fine. They are now our protectorate, which means we control this entire segment of Africa as it ought to be. And let me just take a look at this. I will expand our colony, of course. Now we have a massive, massive Brazilian South Africa right here. You absolutely love to see it. Uh, what? It's 1918? Communist Russia has emerged? Under, under whose leadership? Nikolai Sorokin. I have no idea who that is. I think he's just generated. He's a vanguardist, though. Oh my god. I didn't have an interest here. This would have been really cool if I could have, you know, maybe given them a little push. Oh, that is so cool. This is the first communist Russia that I have ever seen. I don't think they will survive, but hey, that's cool. Now, I am going to be honest with you. I am bankrolling communist Russia. Not just because it would be a cooler story if they won, but also because, well, Russia, if you take it together, produces a boatload of wood. And if they stop trading, who's the one trading the, uh, the wood then? Huh? It would obviously be us. So let's hope they win. That is a pretty tight one here. The communists have their capital in Moscow, but they have taken the Russian capital of St. Petersburg. Plus, again, I'm bankrolling them. Uh, their loans are increasing relatively quickly still, despite my bankroll. But the Russian loans, the proper Russian loans, are increasing much faster. So I think the communists may win this if they can stop the advance in the east. That is the big question here. And now, finally, in 1919, the communists in Brazil have awoken. But I gotta tell you, everybody's happy. We have policing and home affairs institution. There's very few states in turmoil. We're doing great. Uh, I don't think communism is going to take a hold of this nation, which just means, yep, we have played Brazil in the way that it was meant to be played, even in real life. And oh my god, Germany is going in. Look at that, liberate Iraq, Cyprus, Bosnia-Herzegovina, and they want Eastern Thrace. They want the Dardanelles. Wow. Um, in the meantime, it looks like the communists actually stopped the march in the east. They stopped advancing in Poland, but they moved their troops over here now. Moscow, that had almost fallen, I don't think it's actually gonna fall. <laughs> oh, Jesus Christ. The Soviet Union is going in here. They want Moldavia and they want to ban slavery. Let's see how it goes, but yeah. Um... They want some stuff here. And you can see now right here, it is 1931. The Soviet Union has indeed advanced. And quite frankly, they are doing pretty well altogether. They are atheists now. They have a command economy, graduated taxation. Just look at this. I think they actually have a future. Now, this right here is also the end state of, you know, what the campaign actually did. You can see that China imploded. You can see that we are a very prosperous and unbelievably nice Brazil. I can't say the same about all the other parts of the world. Like, for example, Austria right here. They are are still doing fairly poorly, but I think that this is actually pretty interesting. The British, of course, are now on a course for revenge. The Americans still want Oregon, and we are pretty wealthy, but it's going to be more and more difficult to keep this together without any further investment in the Navy. Let me clean up this map right now so that we can see the canonical ending. And there you go. I like cleaning up the map at the end of a playthrough because obviously you can't get to the perfect borders without really just, you know, doing some unnecessary wars. I like the idea, kind of, that Britain lost more land when they were fighting with the French so that this got cleaned up over here. The French also gave, uh, gave some land to the Dutch because, of course, they were allies. I also really like the idea that we gave the British some areas right here in Gabon, Congo, and, of course, in Ecuador, and then they gave us their central areas that were fairly cut off from the rest of their empire. This now makes it so that we are not on good terms with them, but that, you know, indeed, we have asserted our hege hegemony. Britain, on the other hand, is probably eyeing for some revenge, both against us, against the French, against the Americans, against essentially everybody. Whereas the Germans and the Austrians have now been repeatedly at war with the powers that be both in Russia and in the Ottoman Empire. I like to think that this is a pretty interesting setup for, you know, what is to come there. We have the democracies, we have the technocracies, and we even have a major, major communist country in the form of the Soviet Union. And then, of course, we also have a completely imploded China. I always love to see those. Anyway, this is it for this playthrough. I hope that you enjoyed it, and I will see you later, alligator.